So the end, the end of August was ended on kind of a sour note for us Mets fans. You know, it started off that final weekend started off with so much promise. You know, we swept the Yankees in that uh, seven inning doubleheader on Jackie Robinson Day, and then lost the remaining three games of the series. Very winnable games that probably for a lot of Mets fans would have hurt a lot more and stung a lot more if the news didn't come down that Steve Cohen won the bid and he will be the new Mets owner. Of course, we can't just let this story die. At at least if you're the New York Post, you still want to... I think the New York Post hates Steve Cohen is my take on this. That's my take because why else would they keep breathing life into the A-Rod group? All Mets fans, in my opinion, are are in love with Steve Cohen and could care less, couldn't care less about what's going on (laughs) with this season because... Uncle Stevie's on his way to save the day and to save the franchise, really. But there was a story in the New York Post about how A-Rod is pissed and is threatening to pursue legal action or file an appeal and saying, you know, he thinks that the sale was fixed to Steve Cohen, which it's like knowing the Will Pond's relationship with Steve Cohen, why would it be fixed? I did think this was interesting, though. A-Rod and J-Lo's pitch to save their Mets bid included a guarantee, a World Series guarantee, that if the, the Mets would that the Mets would win a world a World Series within the first ten years of their ownership, or they'll donate one hundred million dollars to New York charities, which is very nice. But I don't under, I don't know why the Wilpons would ever give two flying f's about that. Very nice, but okay. I, I think Steve Cohen has the bankroll to make that guaranteed times another hundred million. <laughs> so, you know, it really comes down to money, and if the Wilpons are so or such as much of, uh, you know, as big as penny pinchers as we know them to be, Cohen can just continue to, can continue to throw more and more money at them and the old fuck you money. One last tidbit on the, the Mets sale, though. J-Lo would be the controlling owner. A-Rod has been kind of the name that has been at the forefront. He's the face of that group, but at the same time, he's not bankrolling it. It's, it's J-Lo who would be the controlling owner, which would be very interesting. That's one point in favor of that group. Like, I'd love to see how that would pan out i just like i don't want it to happen but i'd like to take a glimpse into that alternate reality like j-lo as controlling owner you know what do the concerts look like at city field moving forward once this pandemic takes a fucking long walk off a short pier do the uniforms change do we go with the deep v a la her outfit at the 2000 grammys i think that's a good look obviously you know, I'm a shitty comedian and I make shitty jokes. That's what I do. And then we also had some trade. So the trade deadline was at the end of August as well. And I know Mets fans up and down, left and right, all over the world were panicking, clenching our jaws, our fists, our butt cheeks, our buttholes about what Brody Van Wags was going to do. What stupidity was he going to bring to the franchise and exercise at the trade deadline? And yeah, he, he made a couple of kind of really redundant, mind-boggling moves. Previous episode, I was talking about all the available starting pitching arms that are probably out there that we could definitely use, and we did not get a starting pitcher. We could have probably dealt one of our shortstop prospects, considering Jimenez has proven himself to be the better of the two options between him and Rosario. And so Jimenez is your guy at short, it looks like. You keep Rosario, or do you trade him knowing that you have another prospect in the wings? Do you trade the shortstop prospect thinking, okay, Rosario is nice insurance. What's the deal there? To get a starting pitcher, maybe even to get another outfield bat uh, now that, you know, we're kind of hamstrung there. Nope. And so we brought in yet another infielder. And uh, I mean, uh, all things considered, if you're going to bring in an infielder, I'm just happy that they brought Todd back. <laughs> I know a lot. I know a lot of my. There's a contingency of Mets fans that are like, "Fuck Todd Frazier, what the hell?" Like we, there's so like they just didn't want him back. I personally love to have him back because if we do have this wild kind of run in us like we did last year, would like to him to be a part of that. And if we do win a ring, as faulty or fraudulent as people think it is or will be, for him to get a ring with the Mets, it's just so nice. I mean, the whole reason he's back is. Not because we need him per se, although P. Alonzo using Todd Frazier's bat and hitting ding dongs and yabos left and right. Don't hate that. And someone made a joke on Twitter like, does this mean we're going to sign, re sign Frazier to like a six year contract just so Alonzo can use his bat? It's like, sure, why not? But, you know, Frazier is a, a Brody client. He signed, he pretty much signed the Rangers deal before this whole pandemic thing happened, I believe. So now that the pandemic has happened and he hasn't been able to see his family, his family's in New Jersey. 
bring him on back, and then hopefully he can contribute here and there, possibly as a DH, which we already have so many DHs in the mix, but maybe he's a DH, maybe he's the guy. You know, it gives you more options, basically, in the event that maybe someone slumps. I don't know. He's already had a, a, a pretty significant impact in the games that he's played and started. You know, he hit a home run. He's had scoring runs. So he's... uh pumping some light and I know people make fun of that and mock what people say about him and the energy he brings to the clubhouse they mock it they mock ceaselessly but I think he has a positive impact on the the ball club so we'll see how that goes but Jesus like we did not need another infielder especially at third base where we have now have the possibility of Davis McNeil Frazier you could even throw Cano and Jimenez there plenty of third basemen to go around it's the outfield where we have some problems especially in left but you know McNeil made a nice play in left the other game uh the comeback against the Orioles where he he dove and then uh slid and hit the wall does McNeil give you the best option in left defensively yeah I guess so stick Davis at third McNeil needs a day off defensively. Maybe he he gives you a lot of options. So champagne problems in my mind, right? Chemistry be damned. Consistency be be damned. I'm the most inconsistent person in the world. Anyone who's followed this show knows that. (laughs) The other acquisition we made, Miguel Castro, saw this tweet that he has a ridiculous slider. Hitters are three for 17 with 10 strikeouts with a 45.7% whiff rate against his slider this year. The average spin on his slider is 2,948 revolutions per minute, which is tied for per minute. Yeah, per minute. Tied for fourth highest in baseball. I think that's on par with Seth Lugo. Problem is, he's also being compared to Edwin Diaz. And it's like, do we need another Edwin Diaz? The hope was that this is like the Edwin Diaz. Castro could be the Edwin Diaz of 2018. Instead, he is basically like Edwin Diaz of 2019. So... He's either striking out a lot of dudes or giving up like back-breaking home runs to lose games. And that's what we've got so far. So did we, never, did we need another reliever? I don't think so, but we now have a bunch of like relievers that can either be super dominant or they are just losing us ball games. <laughs> there's just, there's no in between. There's no just get outs. We don't care if you strike guys out, just get outs. But my, what what is really incredible about Castro is his body type. You know, I grew up, like I said, I was born in 80. I lived through the steroid era. You know, high that was pretty much end of high towards the end of high school or in high school through into college. So, you know, my most impressionable years were seeing guys that were just yoked. McGuire. Who the hell was that reliever, that closer for the Dodgers, who is just a massive mountain of a man Gagne bigger stronger faster harder is like that's how I always pictured it you know we had a dude in college six eight three hundo would come on the mound and it was intimidating and you no know, he didn't throw a hundred but he would throw close to 90 and you know the arm angle and the and whatever Castro looks like such a small dude just slight and slender that it's insane to me that he's able to 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 fling the ball like he flings you know, mid to up, mid nineties averaging that, that to me is like, it just, uh, from a physics standpoint, I can't wrap my head around it. Cause you, you see bigger guys and you think, Oh, like in order to throw 90 mid nineties to high nineties, you need to be, you know, like, uh, whoever the, whoever the fuck that guy was played for the Yankees and the Cubs, just a big broad shouldered dude. Like a, just a thoroughbred stud, you know, the holidays of the world you know, the Thors of the world, they have to be like these big imposing figures. And then Castro comes along and literally, I don't, I don't know that there's any bone or any muscle on his bones. Like you look at his legs and they're just like toothpicks. And yet this guy's just hurling the ball and, uh, has not been able to fool. I mean, he's either straight, like it's same, same deal as Diaz. First two batters of the inning, he'll strike him out, make him look silly. And then he'll give up a double and a home run. And it's like, holy shit, what the hell just happened? What, what just happened? I would say we whiffed. I'm going to talk about whiff rate. We wh- we whiffed on Miguel Castro. And then the last acquisition, Robinson Chirinos. You know, I had kind of talked about it last year, the last offseason. You know, is that someone we want to bring in? He's on the older side. Defensively, he's good. But offensively, is he going to be the guy that, you know, can contribute to at least offset enough to justify him in the lineup. And it's like he's batting, I think he was batting at the time of the trade, like 126. And I have not seen him do much uh, in the plate, in the box since we got him. Defensively, yeah. 
definitely an upgrade over Wilson Ramos. But again, we 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 pit, we gave away Kevin Smith, a prospect, I think, for a starting pitching prospect for Miguel Castro. That's a, yet another starting pitching prospect, and it's just another damnation of this is just more the evidence is mounting against this dude i mean he's got to be gone after this year he has to be has to be he's given away all our if he did not give away all our starting pitching prospects can you imagine what where we are right now anthony k simeon woods richardson kevin smith uh who was the other pitcher that we just got rid of it's just like it's it's nuts oh jordan humphreys so that was the other thing i was going to talk about i when fraser came back he's wearing 33 and I was like, whoa, that looks weird on him for some reason. I don't know why. I'm just used to him wearing 21. But then you remember, oh, yeah, Billy Hamilton's 21. So what does Billy Hamilton go out and do? Late inning game, close. He gets on. Uh, he's uh, the pinch runner, which is exactly how you use him. You don't use him to hit. You don't use him for defensively. Maybe defensively use him to track down uh, balls in the gap over his head, whatnot. Defensively, he's probably better than what Nimmo's giving you. Maybe even Resnick. But primarily, he's going to be a base stealer, right? That's why we got him. Late innings, he can steal a base, maybe two. He steals second, great. He tries to steal third, gets thrown out. I think Davis is up at bat. Davis then hits a home run. Would have been the go. Would have been the go ahead run. Instead, we're tied when we go into extra innings. I think we ended up winning that game. It was either the Phillies game where we came all the way back, and then end up losing in extras, or it's the Yankees game where we did come back and win, but it took us, you know, an extra inning because Billy Hamilton got thrown out third. So after that blunder, he gets DFA'd, and then the Cubs pick him up off of waivers. So who do we, you know, it's exactly what I didn't want to happen. It's like if we're going to, if you already, if you traded, if you had signed Billy Hamilton in the offseason when you didn't have to trade a prospect for him, all right, fine. You took a flyer on him, didn't work out. You can DFA him and feel good about yourself. But when you trade a top prospect like Jordan Humphreys, 14th ranked prospect for a guy like Billy Hamilton. I mean, you have to see it all the way through. You have to like die by that sword. I understand you know, in business, you want to own up to your mistakes and move on. Totally get that. All for it. You know, put your hand up. But on this one, it's like I would have gone to my grave with Billy Hamilton on the roster and have him continue to be uh, a late inning pinch runner because you have to justify that trade. And now it's not justified. I mean, it's just another strike against BB dubs. I mean, look at these. These numbers are pretty awful. Hamilton hit 0.045. He stole one base, which I guess was the base that I saw where he stole a second. And he posted a negative 0.2 war over 17 games. <sighs> Yikes. Jed Lowry is eligible to be removed off the 45-day injured list. And this is this is where we're at with Jed Lowry. Some reporter asked Rojas about it. And Rojas... Just said, I have no idea what's going on with him. <laughs> so I have no idea. Like at this point, you can just count on us probably not using him and just like handing over $20 million and telling him to go take a hike. The end of August was tumultuous to say the least. I think the ball club was is was in kind of a weird spot. We lost some games that we should have won. You know, we're almost two weeks into September now, and we're about playing like 500 ball, but we could be playing 600 ball. Brody Van Wagenen has has crippled us in our starting rotation pitching. Absolutely crippled us that this is where we are now. Every start that isn't DeGrom or Lugo, I would have put Peterson in that group, but Peterson had an awful outing this most recent go-round. Now you're looking at first two innings, we're in a hole by like five, four or five runs. And so now we have to fight, we have to, battle uphill against that luckily the offense is coming around but how much every game you're gonna have to depend on your offense to keep you to score and score and score and score <laughs> is that what it's gonna be like stupid brody stupid brody since 2019 pete alonzo has hit 21 home runs in the seventh inning or later which is tied with cody bellinger for most in mlb <laughs> hell yeah polar bear pete you know i think there were some haters that were saying okay sophomore slump in full effect you know, Pete's not, he couldn't, he couldn't match what he did last year. He just couldn't capitalize on it and maybe it got into his head. And so that's that for Pete Alonso. Just write him off. No big deal. And instead he now has like 11 home runs after 44 games, you know, extrapolate that to 162. The dude's pretty much almost on pace with what he was doing last year. So good to see him heating up. Thanks to Todd Frazier's bat. MLB hits leaders. 
Michael Conforto. This was from a while. This might have been, I don't know how recent this is, but uh, Michael Conforto is number two, number two in the majors in hits with 53. There are two players with an OPS of 1,000, over 1,000, that have thirty more than 30 RBIs with at least half of their hits going for extra bases, one of which is Mike Trout. The other one is Dominic Smith. So that's very, I mean, that is like, whoa. To mention Dom Smith in the same breath as Mike Trout, that's something. Like I said, we have champagne problems when it comes to our infield and our lineups. The fact that we we have so many good, uh, you know, options is uh, is good to see. Can't say the same for the pitching. Mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. Robert Gesellman, he's fra- has a fractured rib. He's out for the rest of the season. They originally thought it would be a strained oblique. He had a strained tricep in summer camp. He had injuries last year. I mean, I can't remember the last time that he actually finished the season with the club healthy. In six appearances this season, Gesellman pitched to a 9.64 ERA. So it's tough. You you don't want to write him off. You know, I I was not. I want to be on the Gesellman bandwagon for sure. I want to be a fan, but you got to stay healthy, dude. But then you think about Zach Wheeler. Like Wheeler was out of baseball for two full friggin' years, came back and is now pitching at Cy Young level. You know, he's approaching Degrom status. If we had Steve Cohen. Zach Wheeler would, before the 2020 season, Zach Wheeler would be a Met, and who knows where we are. Um, we're definitely not 20 and 24, I'll tell you that much. Edwin Diaz in 2020, 18 innings pitched, 18 innings pitched, 2 ERA, 38 Ks, 19 Ks per 9 innings. And you look at that and you say to yourself, oh, he must have like a bajillion saves. He must be our closer. He must be this. He must be that. And it's just no, 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 no. <laughs> He's not. He is, has proven self unworthy in the closer position. He has now been used mostly in the seventh or eighth innings or in the ninth inning when it's not a non-save opportunity. There are two two groups of people. You know, there are the the statisticians who look at that and say, why do Mets fans hate this guy? You know, why don't you have more trust in him? Why this? Why this? And then you have the Mets fans who have actually seen him pitch in 2019, see what he did to us and see what he did so far in 2020 when given the op- given the reins in a sea of opportunity, and he, no, <laughs> there's a reason why we cringe and we can't bear to watch. It's because when he's put in that situation, in a save situation, he's just not getting the job done. So that's where numbers can lie. They say numbers never lie? Uh, no, nah, that's a lie. Chase and Shreve this season, 18 and two-thirds innings pitch, 23 strikeouts. This was before his latest outing because he got lit up uh, his most recent appearance. But yeah, that's something that's kind of... Fl- that's a guy who's flown a little bit under the radar. He's been Mr. Dependable, Mr. Reliable, and uh, but he's even had some issues. Justin Wilson has been having some issues, so it's like maybe that's w- contributed to why we picked up Castro, but no, just about I don't think anyone outside of maybe Shreve that you can count on. Now that Lugo's in the starting rotation, like who do you go to? It's just kind of like whoever's got the hot hand, whoever feels good that night, whoever's got some pep in their step. <laughs> So uh, I, men- I mentioned this and teased this in the intro. Three; These are the three numbers that tell the Mets story in 2020. This is by Anthony DiComo, MLB.com. The first number is 6.34. That's the Mets rotation ERA minus Jacob deGrom. And if you take out Lugo, that pump that bumps it up to 6.75. Michael Waka and Rick Porcello are big contributors that inflated ERA. Both signed one-year deals. Uh, worth combined $13 million, so half of what we would have paid Zach Wheeler, uh, but they have been an effect of going 2-7 and seven with a 6.29 ERA. Of the 14 games they've started, the Mets have lost 10 of them. <sighs> if we had other options, <laughs> we could pursue it. We just have zero other options. Opposing batters are hitting 326 off Porcello in nine starts this season. Dear God. It's at the point now where I don't think that you bring back I don't think that you bring back Mats into the fold. Gesellman's no longer an option to start or be an opener. I mean, you just got to keep trying people out, I guess. Erasmo Ramirez, he had a good outing. He was not the starter. I think he came in for Waka, or maybe he came in for Peterson in like the second in the most recent game against the Phillies or the Orioles and kept us in the game long enough for us to come back. So maybe Ramirez is an option, but... The Mets have already used more starting pitchers, 10, than they did all last year, 9. And I think that number is only going to go up because I don't know how much longer you can stick around with Waka and Porcello knowing that they're that you are going to be in a fucking five-run hole after two innings. It's like, guys, if you could just give us, like, I'm okay with you giving up one run per inning over five innings. If you can give us five runs over five innings, eh, that's fine. 
five run, five runs right out the gate is so demoralizing. Peterson, Lugo, and DeGrom have a uh, combined ERA of 2.30. Of course, DeGrom is at like 1.69 right now. The other seven starting pitchers, 7.16 ERA. So maybe this last outing from Peterson was just a fluke. Hopefully it is. And so now you're looking for, I think you might even go down to a four-man starting rotation. And you got to look at who in your bullpen gives you the best option to go the longest. Is it Ramirez? Maybe Ramirez is the guy to give you four or five innings. And then you have a committee after Ramirez. So Ramirez is your opener. Hopefully he gives you four, maybe five. And then, you know, it's it's by committee. And then you go back to the ground. <laughs> I think you just have to, you know, just say, Jake, can you give us every four days, can you give us seven innings? And just, you know, hope and pray. The three big Mets offseason acquisitions. Dylan Batances, 6.10 ERA. Rick Porcello, 6.43 ERA. Michael Waka, 7.41 ERA. Barf, vomit, regurgitate. Zach Wheeler has a 2.20 ERA. And I mean, I tell you, I keep saying it, broken record, but with Van Wagenen out, Cohen in, you're not going to see this bullshit anymore. You're not going to see us signing guys that are past their prime over the hill giving them kind of uh, half-assed contracts to see them struggle and, and fail. You, you're you going to see us re-sign our studs. That's why as soon as he's owner, he's going to extend Conforto. He's going to extend Alonzo. He's going to lock up all your top talent now before they have they have an idea. Like DeGrom, that's the one. I mean, you know, KFC and Clem have said this repeatedly on We Gotta Believe, but the Mets, Brody's only had – a couple good moves <laughs> out of dozens. J.D. Davis won maybe Justin Wilson. Resigning DeGrom long term for what what we got for him, what we're paying for him, is just a, is just a heist of the highest order, a theft. I think you can at least get, if you start to talk with those guys, your homegrown talent, your top talent, your Dom Smiths, your McNeils, your Alonzos, your Confortos, your Nimmos. Yeah, I'll put Nimmo in that category. Lock up that core team membership now. You won't have to pay more later. Long term, team friendly to a certain extent, where it's like if they get hurt, yeah, we we want some of that money back. But I think you know these guys have proven themselves enough to to extend them. And Thor, you know, I mean, people kind of forget about Thor. That okay, he had Tommy John, but you look at guys that have had Tommy John and have come back. Wheeler. So I think uh, he'll come back bigger and better than ever. But Jesus, man, Brody really fucked over the squad. And it sucks because in, in someone, I think it might have been from the Post, Sherman or Schwartz or whoever, said that, uh, yeah, we are wasting Jacob DeGrom's prime <laughs> with the, the kind of uh, squad we're putting together. So that's on Brody. I think Sandy Alderson did what he could given his constraints. Brody has done way, way worse uh, given those same constraints. So now that the constraints, the handcuffs are off and we're, we're free to spend, I think we will not waste DeGrom from this point forward. He will put up, personally, he'll probably put up quote unquote worse numbers, but I think the team that we're going to surround him with is going to compensate for that. So he doesn't have to throw seven innings of one, of one run ball. He can give us six of three runs and still win. The next number on this article, 52. It's the number of points between the Mets' major league leading batting average with the bases empty, which is 289, and their mark with runners in scoring position, which is 237, which is like, whoa, dude. Whoa. Can you imagine if they're just, if they are able to split that difference? If they're hitting 260 with runners in scoring position, how different this season is? Definitely not 20 and 24. The last number that we're looking at is 647. That is the uh, what the Mets probably will have to, the record, the winning percentage that we'll have to put up in order to make the playoffs. Of course, we could make the playoffs with a 500 record, but the odds are not great. Considering what we were able to do last year, winning 15 of 16 to put us back in the hunt, it's not outside the realm of possibility. It's just that we also had a different rotation last year. We had, we were more, we were, our bullpen was starting to come into its own at this point last year and uh, weren't blowing saves and weren't giving up. You know, we had Lugo had moved firmly entrenched himself as the closer and we had 
Strowman and Mats and Thor and, and Wheeler and DeGrom. And so we were clicking more in the starting rotation. We don't have that this year. So 12 straight games against teams in playoff position. Ooh, boy. Not looking great. Not looking great. Next up, we have the, I guess, the Blue Jays in Buffalo tonight. Hopefully we can call them Bill's Mafia to give us some, to pump us up. Maybe we need to jump off some RVs onto some breaks and tables to get the juices flowing so that we can. I mean, the Blue Jays are in a tough spot as well. I think Bichette is hurt. I think one of their starting pitchers is hurt. So maybe we're catching them at a good time. But we do have to end up facing the Rays who are white hot. Taking a look at the playoff odds. This is from baseballreference.com. They have the, the Dodgers most likely winning the West and the, being the top seed. The Braves winning the East. The Cubs winning the Central. And then you have the Padres getting one of the wild cards. The Cardinals getting a wild card. The Phillies, Giants, and Marlins as the remaining three wild cards. Insane to me that the Marlins are still like playing at the level that they are crazy and then there's also some there's news now that even if the cardinals don't play a full 60 that they'll still be awarded a playoff spot no 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 i don't like that not one bit uh baseball reference projects us to finish out the season eight and eight so the remaining 16 games will 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 play 500 ball and end up with like a 28 and 32 record which oof, I, unbelievable they have 90 percent confidence that we'll finish with a 31 and 29 record as a like a best case scenario and a worst case scenario 25 and 35 so there's a 10 percent chance that we fall outside that range you know stranger things have happened and we have a 34 percent chance of securing the wild card yeah could be worse you know walk and porcello have to like give us something give us something better than what they're giving us this is a tweet from rich mcleod mcleod McLeod, I don't know. The Mets have been under 500 for 41 straight days. We've lost three fifths of our starting rotation, trailing in almost every game in the bottom five of, with runners in scoring position. More blown saves than saves. And he says we're not making the playoffs. And it's like, all right, all right. You make some good points there. That's not over the court. You know, I think because it is a smaller sample size than you know over the course. If we were in a 162 game season in September, I think maybe that would hit home a little more. I think the fact that teams have these kind of, they have these stretches of time. So we, this is not, this is, you're looking at basically a little over a month and a half of a season. And so these kind of things can happen over a month and a half. But you know what else can happen? What happened to us at the end of 2007 and 2008? What happened to us in 2019 where we went on a run? The mentality, the, the thinking in the clubhouse is that, yeah, we're very capable of going on a run. And we're going to get hot. We're going to go on a streak. And damn the torpedoes, like full st full steam ahead. <laughs> like we don't care their starting pitchers are giving up five innings in the first. We're going to come back and make a game of it. I like the thought process. I like the attitude that they have. They're very positive. It seems like they're, you know, they feel like they can beat any team. And it's just like we got to take two or three from every freaking series. There is no, there is no, uh, you can't lose tight games, one run games. Got to win them. How they're going to bootstrap that together? beyond me but this Ramirez dude might be the answer I mean he did get knocked around but it was like I don't care if you're getting ripped as long as they end up in someone's glove and it's an out <laughs> I think that gladly take that over a dude that strikes out two of the three batters he faces and then gives up a, a death knell home run